The 1st of January 2021 commemorated 100 years since the release of a film that was so universally praised in its day that its director, Victor Strostrom, was acknowledged as one of the greatest directors in cinema. Charlie Chaplin would even praise the film as the best film he had ever seen. Yet, as with many masterpieces from the silent era, Shakalin, or The Phantom Carriage, which I'll be calling it from now on, is rarely mentioned by anyone other than silent film enthusiasts. In fact, one could possibly argue that for casual silent film fans, this film, as well as other Swedish pieces, have been somewhat overshadowed by German expressionists like Fritz Lang or Monod or Francis Abel Gantz, not to mention what was being produced in Hollywood. This has been on my to-watch list for a wee while, um, though I have to admit right off the bat that I don't know much about Swedish cinema. However, for a brief period from 1912 to the mid-20s, Sweden was considered to produce some of the most beautiful and prestigious films in the world, with a wealth of talent that fled to Hollywood, which more or less ravaged the Swedish film industry, until Ingmar Bergman came along in the 1950s. Victor Stroström has often been named as the father of Swedish film's first golden age. And The Phantom Carriage is probably his most acclaimed Swedish work. 100 years on, it has a score of 100% on Rotten Tomatoes and is listed amongst the 1001 movies you must see before you die. And it has been cited as highly influential to directors such as F.W. Murnau, Stanley Kubrick and of course Ingmar Bergman who was said to have watched it over 100 times and would go on to actually cast Victor Sjöström in his last film, 1958's Wild Strawberries. Reminiscent of a Dickensian tale of redemption, The Phantom Carriage is set on New Year's Eve with a dying Salvation Army nurse, Sister Edith, demanding that the local drunk, David Holm, played by Sjöström, be brought to her deathbed. Home is a man that not only wrecks his own life, but everyone around him. His children fear him, and his wife is exhausted and traumatised. As the clock approaches the midnight hour and a new year, Home and two drinking buddies booze it up in a graveyard. He recalls a tale his old chum George once told him about the mythical phantom carriage and that the last sinner to die of the year is fated to drive the carriage for the next year, collecting all the dead souls. Holm amusedly notes that the fearful George himself died the previous 31st of December. When I asked to attend to Sister Edith, Holm aggressively refuses, prompting his two companions to turn against him. The trio fight and Holm ends up with a bottle to the head. With his soul leaving his body at the stroke of midnight, the carriage appears driven by George, who's ready to relinquish his grim duties and pass the reins on to David Holm. Before doing so, Holm is forced to relive the destruction and misery that he has caused through a series of flashbacks from the various terrifying abuses that he's inflicted upon his family, influencing his murderous brother and Sister Edith catching tuberculosis from him. Things get surprisingly dark, with one scene very reminiscent of The Shining, involving Holm breaking down a door with an axe, as his terrified family attempt to escape. And in the closing scenes, David's wife, Anna, is so emotionally drained, herself ill with consumption and trapped by the abuse of her husband, that we are led to believe that she will commit filicide to protect her children from her husband. And the film is so convincingly bleak at this point that I was genuinely scared. David Holmes' complete horror at what he has reduced his wife to and his evident remorse results in George's allowing him to live. His soul returns to his body. David rushes home to stop his wife from the murder-suicide and begs forgiveness. Naturally, she's unsure, but his tears convince his wife that he is truly wanting to reform and they decide to move forward together. 
The Swedish film industry was little over a decade old when this film was produced and Schrostrom had been celebrated as a master of the medium for much of that time. Yet the director was frustrated by the early limitations of cinema and so he pushed the boundaries of what could be achieved visually and with the narrative. While flashbacks had been utilised in a few films before, the Phantom Carriage's plot structure is complex with flashbacks within flashbacks and demands the audience pay attention. It is through the flashbacks that we see David had once been a decent man and we are witness to his descent into debauchery. This is intercut with David's presence. We see his growing anxiety and remorse as he watches each heinous act that he has committed. And this keeps the plot moving at a good pace and keeps us engaged. The film also features impressive special effects for the period, with David Holm and George semi-transparent throughout most of the film. This wasn't the first time double exposure was employed in film, and yes, the effects are antiquated in comparison with what we have today, but the scenes still generate a sense of creeping dread, specifically in the scene when the carriage crosses the sea and the driver collects a drowned soul from the ocean floor. As his filmography grew, it became evident that Schrostrom was influenced by the themes of redemption and forgiveness, and this was shared in the work of Selma Lagerhoff, whose novels Schrostrom would adapt four times. The first female winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1909, Lagerhoff had also inaugurated the International Conference for Suffragettes in 1911 which possibly explains the depth of the two female leads. As Holmes' wife Anna, Hilda Borgstrom, believably goes from contentment to ghastly despair, she is broken and it can be painful to watch. On the surface, Astrid Holmes' sister Edith seems typical of the silent ingenue, virtuous and self-sacrificing. But the character's charity and interest in David turns out to be motivated by her own sexual attraction towards the drunk. Her desire prompts her to encourage Anna and David to disastrously reunite and ultimately Edith is riddled with guilt. Schrostrom's David Holm is a horrendous person, but the character never drifts into absurdity. He's not a sneering pantomime villain. He keeps us interested and we root for his redemption. Despite the supernatural plotline, the performances throughout the film are naturalistic, with subtle mannerisms. Something that might date the film is perhaps the way in which it interprets alcohol and addiction. David and his brother's depravity is purely blamed on George or the bottle, as if neither had free will. It's almost implied if neither had met George, they wouldn't have become drunks. We don't see why they started drinking and the downfall seems very extreme and sudden. It's shown in fact at a transitional shot and the home's young children don't seem to age throughout the film. I believe the film echoes the message of the temperance movement and implies a drunk has no free will, that one sip of alcohol is one sip too many and 100 years later and coming from a country that admittedly has issues with alcohol, this perhaps may seem too preachy and a bit just say no for modern tastes. However, this is just a minor gripe. The plot and characters, despite their dire circumstances, are compelling. And sadly, addiction and abuse never goes away. The characters and performances are relatable, thanks to the emotional, raw, instinctive performances that don't drift into exaggeration, which most people may associate with silent cinema. This naturalism was a staple of Swedish cinema, a continuation of what Strindberg and Norwegian playwright Henrik Ibsen had strived for upon the stage. However, on celluloid, Sweden wanted to reflect this naturalism visually, and Swedish cinema is notable for a photo photographing rustic real landscapes and opting to use daylight rather than interior studios as Hollywood or Germany were doing. 
Now, due to the special effects, the Phantom Carriage had to shoot exterior scenes in a studio. However, when permitted, there are plenty of beautifully bleak landscapes. Visually, the film is arresting. When we first see David with his family, it's a flashback to happier times with a beautiful Nordic landscape. It's brightly lit with filtered sunlight. This shows a healthier, contented time and a people at one with nature. The scenes with David in the graveyard are reminiscent of the classics from German Expressionists, which were being produced at a similar time. The majority of the film is set in oppressive darkness, which is reminiscent of David Holmes' soul and the other characters' feelings of hopelessness and loss. The darkness and the shadows also symbolise the end, the end of life, the end of the year. However, this darkness seems organic. Unlike Expressionism, this darkness isn't stylized. There's no shadow play. This is set and will be recognisable to Sweden, where the winter only provides a few hours of daylight. The Phantom Carriage is less of a silent horror, but more of an eerie ghost story. The introduction and the sight of the Phantom Carriage provides a foreboding sense of dread, but this quickly becomes a story about humans, and the true horror is not from the inevitability of death, but what is within David's damaged psyche, and the terrible things this man is prepared to do, even to the people he professes to love. The film is genuinely moving, and the plot feels remarkably fresh and mature, even though it it's not that dissimilar to A Christmas Carol. If you're a casual silent film fan like myself, I would highly recommend this film, though this might be a tough watch for a newbie. Fingers crossed I get the opportunity to review more Swedish or Scandinavian cinema. I would certainly like to check out more of the work of Victor Schroestrom. Uh, Not long after this film was produced, he went to Hollywood and made a few films, most notably with Lon Chaney and The Wind with Lillian Gish, which um, comes highly recommended. And hopefully, if I do get a chance to see them, I can review them for this channel. Um, If you have made it to the end of this video, thank you. I truly appreciate it. And please consider liking this video or subscribing or leaving a comment. This is a perpetual learning curve for me, so any feedback would be truly appreciated. In the meantime, thanks and goodbye.